Welcome folks. We'll give everyone a moment to join in. Just another moment here as we get everyone into the webinar. And welcome to ARMA International's webinar, How to Balance Information Access Demands and Risk Management Throughout the Information Lifecycle. I'm Nick Inglis. I'm the Executive Director of Content and Programming at ARMA International and I'll be both your host and a participant in today's webinar. For those of you who have attained your IGP already, the Information Governance Professional Certification, today's webinar counts towards one continuing education credit in the information management category. If you have a question throughout the webinar, feel free to ask uh, in the Q&A box. We are unlikely to get to all questions today, but we will respond to any questions that we receive after the webinar has concluded. Before we get started today, I want you to consider doing something great for yourself, all while helping support ARMA this year. ARMA professional members continue to say over and over again that they're wildly satisfied with what they're receiving as a professional member. Over 95% of our members say that they would recommend ARMA membership to colleagues. And frankly, I don't know of any other association that comes even close on that metric. ARMA is on the rise and we need your help uh, to help us get that message out. The people who are managing information in their organizations, only a very small percent are actual ARMA members. And that needs to change. We need your help getting the word out. Remember that feeling that you had when you first discovered ARMA and all the resources that you gained access to I want you to take a moment this week and share that feeling with colleagues, uh, get other people on the path towards success and encourage your company or organization to make everyone who's managing information a member of ARMA International. We even offer group discounts to make it easier for you to connect your company or organization with ARMA. Share the feeling of knowing that you're not alone in this. Share ARMA professional membership. The ARMA Conference 2019 is coming up quickly in October. We're calling it the ARMA InfoCon in recognition of the merger between ARMA and the Information Coalition's Information Governance Conference. This year is going to be absolutely incredible with amazing keynote sessions, over 140 education sessions. There are educational workshops and a leadership summit to you uh, available for you as well uh, as a plus registrant. We've got registration open right now. Uh, Arm is on the rise and our conference this year is going to be a wealth of learning, networking, and you don't have to share this part with your boss, but it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, register now at arma.org slash infocon. That's right here on your screen. Uh, today, we are joined by Ann Snyder, the manager of content development here with me at Arma, and Dennis Chapurnov, the principal and product marketing at Highlands. Dennis, Ann, hello. Hey, how are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, Arm is incredibly thankful for the financial support that makes programming like this possible. When choosing business partners and solutions for your information programs, I hope that you'll give extra consideration to the solution providers who continue to invest in you. Solution providers like Highland. Uh, and uh, welcome. Do you want to talk about what uh, our agenda is for today? Sure. Thanks, Nick. Um, so today our information professionals are operating in an increasingly complex legal and regulatory environment. Our information is flowing faster in greater volumes and through more channels than ever before. And at the same time, our employees, customers, and business partners alike have an expectation, and I, I think it's fair to say need, for almost instantaneous access to their information. So how do you get information in the right hands, the right information in the right hands at the right time, while managing risks and making sure that it doesn't get into the wrong hands. And that's what we're discussing today. Now that's a, a really tall order to cover in a single hour webinar. So don't, I don't want you to have any expectation that you're gonna walk away from today with the solution. Uh, first, there's not a single solution to this problem. It's very complex. But by the end of this, we'd like you to walk away at least with an understanding of the challenges that we're facing and some of the things that you should consider 
as you tackle this problem. So today we're going to discuss why you need to take an information lifecycle approach to managing access demands and risks. We'll look at some of the consequences of information falling into the wrong hands and of it's not getting into the right ones when we need it. And that's just as important. This is the value side really of your information. We're gonna look at the complexities uh, that add to this challenge and then we'll turn to the components that you need to consider as part of the solution. And then after that, I'll hand it off to Dennis uh, to talk a little bit about what Highland does and the solutions that they offer. And then we'll open it up for a Q and A. Can you switch to the next slide? I'm trying. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so this infographic, uh, I think some of you have probably seen this before, is um, ARMA's representation of the information lifecycle. There are different approaches to representing this, but this is ARMA's. Uh, from the moment information enters your organization's information environment, from it, when it's created and captured to the moment that it leaves uh, through defensible disposition, you have to manage these access demands and the risks associated with your information. Now, some of those um, concerns are going to, and, and access needs are going, to con are going to change over the information life cycle during the active uh, management phase, the active use phase, for example. Um, you'll need to share and collaborate on information more, but even through retention, when things move out of that active use phase, you still need access to information for other reasons, including uh, discovery. As long as you retain that information, of course, there's a risk of it's falling into the wrong hands. Um, and by the way, you might think of defensible disposition, that sort of, um, that end stage as the final revocation of access and the final securing of your data. And I caution there, um, you know, you have to make sure you've gotten rid of all the copies. Of course, you can't breach what you don't have, and that's part of the reason why that last step, uh, defensible disposition, is so important. Got to get rid of all those copies. Um, I, I want to talk about the 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 consequences of not managing those risks and access demands. And we, we break this into two categories and Anne's gonna really dive into each of these. Um, but first is the costs and risks of inappropriate access to sensitive information. And here we're talking about things like the, the risk of lawsuit and the cost of lawsuits, uh, the risk and costs of investigations and legal fees, um, the cost of once you discover the issue, solving the problem and remediating that issue, uh, the, the, the reputation risk to your organization, um, the, the revenue risk that comes along with all of this, uh, you know, as a, an organization uh, is breached, uh, business partners tend to keep you at arm's length. They don't want to do business with an organization that they potentially see as a risk. Um, as well as the, 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 the breach of potential privileged information, personally identifiable information of your, your customers, your clients, uh, as well as potentially your staff. Um, you may also have things like trade secrets uh, and, and intellectual property uh, that, that is a potential cost and risk here. Um, and on the, the cost and risk uh, of not having the necessary access, uh, folks will find workarounds to these things um, if we don't do this right. And that poses additional challenges uh, uh, for, for productivity and it presents a, a slew of additional risks uh, of, of shadow IT. Um, not having the necessary access also is gonna cut down on your employee productivity um, it's going to cause damage to your, your customer and business relationships. Um, and do you want to talk more about the costs and risks of the inappropriate access to sensitive info? Sure. I, I actually, I think, I think you may have jumped, you might have jumped ahead on some of the things that I was about to talk about. So, um, you know, no, it's, <laughs> so of course, you know, the, the issue is depending on what information was exposed uh, you may have a need to report it. I mean, not not all uh, exposure of information is important, but if it's sensitive information, PII and so on, uh, you may have an obligation to report it to appropriate agencies, let people know what, what the nature of the breach is. And of course, you're going to face potential lawsuits and investigation, and you, you have all of the sequelae of nasties that follow that, the legal and other support costs associated with those. 
Um, and on top of that, then you have things like legal judgments, settlements, and fines. We have uh, recently in the news, well, there's another breach today, but I had to turn the, the news off because uh, I, I, I just couldn't take another one. Uh, but the Equifax breach, for example, was $570 million um, you know, in, in uh, uh, settlement and fines combined. Uh, and that's, that's uh, pretty significant. Um, then you have the remediation costs. So, so what happened? So something happened that caused information to get outside of your protected environment to expose that information. Um, and now you have to fix that. And those costs can be incredibly expensive. Um, just even figuring out what the problem was, finding where the information is and trying to, in some ways, claw it back. Um, and Nick mentioned things like damage to reputation and lost revenue. If you are, um, you know, a business partner with people or you're doing, you know, commerce with people in a, in a trusted industry, for example, um, a breach of sensitive data, not protecting it, not caring for your customers in that way can really uh, damage your reputation. Now, what, what's the size of the typical breach? They're all over the place. It really depends on a lot of factors. The magnitude can be impacted by what was breached, um, how the information was exposed, how much of it was exposed. And a lot of it also hinges on the organization's conduct before, during, and after the exposure. Uh, was the organization uh, taking reasonable steps before the breach? Is this an accident? Did it ignore known risks uh, in a careless sort of way? And then how did it address the breach once they became aware of it? Um, did they respond to the incident you know, promptly and uh, give the appropriate notification? Um, Nick also mentioned about theft of intellectual property. So this is a, you know, a, a concern not only for external threats, but a common uh, concern within the organization too. Um, and Dennis, I, I know that we had discussed, um, you know, some of the, the issues with, with access to sensitive information and you had some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, we definitely in an age when the risk is there and it's it's growing, it's more sophisticated in many ways when it comes to information management, right? We often kind of focus on a risk that originates from malicious activity, right? Because it grabs mm -hmm. a lot of headlines, you know, something is stolen, there's a break in, you know, there's there's that kind of malicious element too. But we gotta remember too, the breaches often occurred as a result of unintentional kind of not malicious activity, right? So we, mm -hmm. you know, our, our environment at work uh, when it comes to information management has changed so drastically. Uh, you know, our practices are sort of the norms around information management have changed. And that's creating a lot of vulnerabilities in itself. Mm -hmm. So think about things like commingling of personal and work related data on our devices and and our applications, right? So we may be using the same email application or the same phone to access both work and personal data. So that makes it much more difficult to kind of separate some of the governance around that those particular types of data. Also think about increased uh, sharing and collaboration around mm -hmm. information, right? So that's one of the norms of today's information management as, as well as we often send this information out we share it with customers, with partners, we collaborate on files. That again creates sort of these areas of vulnerability when it comes to protecting that data if we're not planning accordingly. Mm -hmm. Also consider that, you know, people today stay in the same job or the same role a lot less than uh, in terms of duration of time than they did say 10 years ago, right? Now it's not unusual for somebody to leave an organization or a department after being there maybe barely a year, right? It used to be unheard of, but nowadays it's kind of pretty much the norm. So what happens to that data, right? When these people are trying to, you know, potentially rightfully so separate and kind of retain some of their personal data after they're moving on to another organization. Um, sometimes, quite often actually, you know, they end up um, taking some of the uh, organizational data with them as well. And that's something, again, it's the new norm. We have to prepare for that. We have to plan for that and put the controls in place and policies in place that will help us manage that better. I, and I, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And I, I think that that idea of co-mingling of the data and sort of the, the, the continued hopping from one job to another, people can accumulate a tremendous amount of co-mingled data and then have to disentangle it in a very, very short period of time and not have the tools to do that. So I, I do agree that not all, not all breaches, not all uh, exposures to information are necessarily um, uh, nefarious. Um, so of course, though, um, you know, with breach in the news, 
uh, seemingly every single week or maybe every single day, we tend to focus on this inappropriate access. But of course, we need our information uh, to do our work. Uh, there are studies out there that show that people spend a tremendous amount of time searching for information and sometimes recreating it when they can't find it. Uh, different estimates out there could be up to hours per week per person for a typical knowledge worker. So if you multiply that across an entire workforce, you're talking about a tremendous loss in productivity um, and, and just dollar costs, basically. And Dennis, I know that um, you, were, you and I had been talking about this sort of ability to use our information from its value side as one of the issues. Again, we focus on risk a lot, but we sometimes forget the, the, the use and value side of it. Yeah, I think it's easy to kind of get distracted by the big headlines, you know, of the breaches and, and again, sort of the risk. And it's, it's top of our mind because it can result in fines, it can result in people losing their jobs mm -hmm. if there's a breach at the organization. But, you know, that's the flip side of information governance is, you know, in addition to reducing risk, it's also uh, increasing the value of information, right? So we, mm -hmm. we definitely want to make sure that the information we have within the organization is leveraged that it is easily accessible, right? So the old saying goes something like, you know, get, get the right information to the right people at the right time, right? That can make all the difference in the world. And it, it sounds so elementary, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to accomplish because we kept, keep adding more data and more systems into organizations, right? So just getting the right information to the right person at the right time is not always easy. But, but I, I tell you this, if, if we plan for it, if we make it work, it can be just an absolutely delightful experience for everybody involved. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of one example where we um, at Highland just brought on a new customer with our um, content management platform. And this was a major US healthcare system. So they had uh, 12 hospitals, they had over 60 clinics throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. And so we, we stood them up, you know, they deployed our environment and, you know, we, we spent a lot of time planning the implementation and ensuring that all the business rules were properly uh, built into the into the workflows and a month later um, an auditor pops into one of their hospitals for a surprise uh, lab uh, audit and I think if I say a surprise audit to anybody it's going to instill <laughs> some panic <laughs> right? right it's going to ruin your day potentially right <laughs> So, but, but the beauty of this moment was that they simply gave the auditor the planned uh, access controls that they already mm -hmm. had in place. They gave them access to the right data, to the right reports, uh, filtered specifically for that particular type of auditor for that location. And the beauty of this was that everybody went home happy that day because the auditor got what they needed without having to wait, without having to, you know, talk to a bunch of different people. Mm -hmm. um, the staff were uh, able to just continue with their jobs uh, as they would any other day instead of being disrupted by the audit and running around with their hair on fire, trying to pull the right reports and, uh, you know, being stuck in interviews all day. And, and the, their patients, again, they didn't even know this was going on, right? They were being taken care of as the auditor was there. They didn't have to shut down. They didn't have to call people and cancel. Mm -hmm. So the customer was taken care of as well. So I think that's the beauty here is that if we plan for this, and, and who knows our business processes better than we do, if mm -hmm. we plan for this with information management, we can have this absolutely beautiful experience for both our employees, uh, customers, and also any third parties that are involved. I, I think this is a really interesting example, too, because I, I think that most or many people would think of you know, responding to an auditor as the, the risk side of information, but we can see how it's, it's also connected to the, the value side of it. So you were able to serve up this information when it was needed. There was no disruption to the workflow. And, you know, making those kinds of risks that we know are going to happen um, part of our, our business process, I think, is, a, is the kind of a strategy we want to be thinking of. E-discovery happens, audits happen, and if we plan for those in the normal course, when we're faced with those unexpected challenges, we're better able to ha handle them. And this is that perfect example where um, they were able to serve that, that information up like it was routine because it was for them. So um, thanks for sharing that one. Um, so uh, you know, and of course, uh, you know, beyond our employees, uh, we, um, who, you know, needing information, um, you know, at the, at the, at, you know, at their fingertips and needing it immediately, our customers and, and business partners have a growing expectation 
that they should have ready access to information. And again, I think that that's important. It's, it's a bit of a changed expectation of the, how ready it has to be, but we live in the information age. We need to be able to access our information pretty quickly. Um, delays and slow response times can, of course, strain customer and business relationships, damage an organization's reputation, and even lead to lost revenue when people start to look elsewhere for business. And, um, you know, I, I think, Dennis, you and I were talking about sort of the, the, the world of changed expectations that we're seeing out there in terms of availability of access to information. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly things have changed and how people's expectations sort of rose to new heights. You know, we're so used to interacting with data sort of instantaneously in all of our personal platforms, right? Social media, internet, um, and and our, our own devices, right? So we, we kind of anticipate the same thing, both as customers and employees when we interface mm -hmm. with an organization. And and when when something doesn't go smoothly, it just feels so jarring to us now, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I have to wait an extra minute for this, right? This is just unacceptable. And, and I think that, you know, the, the way we manage information and make it available to our customers and our partners can actually become a competitive differentiator these days. I think it's it's not um, unreasonable to think that, you know, as a consumer, I would be turned off by an organization who makes it difficult for me to interface with the data that I think I should have um, available to me pretty easily and intuitively. So, mm -hmm. you know, they can easily move on to another uh, vendor or provider, as, as I certainly would. If I have a choice, um, I wouldn't want to put up with that myself. So I think you're right. We definitely have changed expectations. And, and that, again, is something we just have to plan for as an organization. I think and again, I, I think that that's, I think it's a really interesting thing to point out where, you know, I, I was couching it in the terms of uh, damage to reputation when you can't find it, but you're also, you're, you're looking at it from the different perspective, which is, you know, competitive advantage, seeing it as a value add. And I think it's, it's always good to look at these issues from, from both of those perspectives. Um, Nick, if you could flip to the next slide, um, we're looking at the the challenges to managing risks and access demands. There are a lot of factors that add to the challenges of, of managing these risk and access demands over the, the life of information. But some of those life, lifetimes, the retention periods can be incredibly long. Uh, so I just uh, came out of the, the pharma industry, the biotech and pharma industry, and we have uh, retention periods that are life of product plus 25 years, things like that. So um, long, long beyond the time that the typical, typical person is going to jump from one job to another um, and, and possibly um, long, long after many of us are gone. Um, so one, one obvious factor in the, the complexity of, um, you know, that one, one obvious factor that adds to this complexity is uh, the legal and regulatory environment in which we operate. Um, you know, organizations are contending with a growing number of requirements concerning how they inf handle their information. This goes to everything from um, how long, how the information is stored, how it has to be accessed, how long it must be retained, um, and also even um, when it must be deleted. And the volume, complexity, and jurisdictional va variation of legal and regu regulatory requirements adds to the levels of that challenge. So you can think of um, just even a multi-state or multinational organization can effectively be facing um, hundreds of jurisdictions, uh, legal and regulatory requirements. And of course, it's not a once and done consideration. Uh, those rules, uh, those laws and regulations are constantly changing. And a, and a layer upon all of those other layers is that there's a challenge to keep current with that information. And, you know, one of the challenges, Anne, too, is that, you know, you mentioned multinational kind of multi-jurisdictional scenarios. I think you know, today we have even another layer of complexity is that you don't have to have offices in these other jurisdictions. If you have mm -hmm. customers there, you're impacted, right? So I'm thinking of regulations like GDPR, for example, or the new, um, you know, California Consumer Protection uh, Privacy Act that's coming, um, you know, January 1st next year, and then New York is following up in, in March. So this this is kind of a sweeping change, I think, in our perception of how uh, some of the data that we handle uh, should be managed, and and it's in some ways it's it's it sort of alters our core understandings of how we interact with some of this data. You know, for one, look at GDPR for example, right? So this is EU's privacy regulation that affects any co country, any company that has customers who are based in the European Union. So it doesn't matter if you're you know if you're a public 
college in, in Alabama, if you have international students from EU, you're impacted by that regulation. But, you know, one of the things that it, it makes very evident is that um, regulators no longer view these personally identifiable pieces of data like name, contact, um, you know, passwords, account numbers, social security numbers. They no longer view it as something that organization has ownership over, right? We're sort of mm -hmm. temporary custodians of that data. We're never intended to hold it indefinitely. We can't uh, manage it like we own it. We have to manage it with, with uh, extraordinary due diligence and due care these days. And, and so this is really forcing organizations to re-examine many of those steps along the information lifecycle management uh, diagram that we looked at, right? So you have to look at retention management now has to be different based on business purpose, uh, geographical location perhaps, and some of the other factors. Uh, you have to look at uh, access and security of this information. Uh, as ha having to be managed differently as well. Uh, you also need to worry about third party processing, right? So one of the things that these regulations make very clear is that we are now responsible for breaches and oversights of our partners. You know, so if you're outsourcing billing, if you're outsourcing any other kind of business process that exchanges mm -hmm. this uh, confidential customer information with your business partners, you're ultimately responsible for anything that happens uh, at their organizations because you are the organization that uh, has initiated this data gathering and data management, right? So it's, it's hard to, 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 to think of an organization that's not doing that. And, um, huh. that, you know, who, who isn't actually sharing yeah, that I kind mean, of information think, or working with outside partners in that way? Yeah, we're all trying to focus on our core competencies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're an insurance provider, you're probably not printing your own insurance cards, right? Well, right. that's that's a great example of a breach that's waiting to happen because mm -hmm. you may be very well protected, but does is that print shop down the street have the same level of protection around that customer data. Right. All right. So exactly. that, it's our responsibility to now vet that properly and plan for that as well. And it's, it's interesting too, I think some of these, uh, and I want to move on quickly because I think we, we have to make up a little bit of time here. Um, the GDPR and these privacy requirements are sort of pushing in the opposite direction from, you know, our the, the way we commonly thought of our information. We used to think about minimum um, retention periods. How long must I keep this uh, to comply. Uh, and uh, now we're sort of pushing the opposite direction to maximum retention periods. When must I get rid of this information? So, um, and I think that's only going to get worse with, you know, we're always see, seeing California in the US and New York, there's some speculation that we're going to see, you know, 50 jurisdictional variations, you know, plus the territories and stuff. Um, if the federal government doesn't intervene and, and you know, put together something more comprehensive. So um, let's move on to quickly to the complexity of the information environment. Uh, I mean, I think everyone understands this pretty, pretty basically. They, it, our information is often spread across uh, numerous disparate locations and file formats. Small organizations may have dozens of applications and uh, storage locations. Large organizations can have um, hundreds and hundreds of places where their information is stored. You know, add to this that we have um, an increasingly mobile workforce and we're spreading our information across portable devices, laptops, smartphones, and so on. We have um, lots of file format types. Um, and the other, another aspect is that we have information that has, um, you know, for lack of a better word, dimensions. A file can have attachments, comments, track changes. And what's, what's curious to me about the, that aspect of it is it, it seems to me that that's where some of the really sensitive information seems to, to find its way, like in those crevices of the documents. So I, you know, think about the, the way that you probably interact with documents, comments, your marginalia can be some of the most sensitive stuff that you're putting in those documents. I think about this in the e-discovery con context, we often encountered um, sensitive, privileged and work product information in the marginalia. And sometimes if you have those kinds of things turned off and you share a document, um, basically all someone has to do is basically enable that functionality to see that very highly sensitive information. <laughs> Pardon me. So, um, and Dennis, we, we have been talking too also about, you know, the complexities of in information being spread. Yeah, I, th I think, and um, I, I think that we definitely have a much broader information landscape today where we have you know more systems we have more file types we have more devices and 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 you know part of the challenge with that is that 
if we're not tracking where everything is or what type of information resides in which systems, uh, one of the risks, you know, and I think that's some, something that Nick spoke to as well, is one of the risks when we have that breach, uh, it may take us a while to determine exactly what's been accessed, what's been breached, right? So say a laptop is lost, how many of us uh, within the organization are absolutely confident we know exactly what's on every laptop in that organization? Right, and that's just a very basic example, right? Oftentimes, you know, these breaches can happen over duration of time. Uh, uh, perpetrators may have access to a particular system for uh, as long as six to eight months. Is, is all, that, that's often how long it takes for organization to determine that they've been breached. So imagine if you don't know where everything is and what's where, uh, just figuring out what's been breached, who needs to be alerted, what kind of risk, what kind of fines, what kind of costs are we looking at, that may take a while in itself. And we'd also talked about the, about the growing volume of information and the impact and how it sort of outstrips our ability to manually handle Absolutely. the processing I mean, of that information. Yeah, it's like it's the unspoken um, sort of flip side of digital transformation, right? So there is a lot of great things about digital transformation, about removing uh, manual processes and paper and so forth. But but there is there's also this, you know, the the effect of it is that we are adding more data, we're adding more system, and it's it's not going to slow down, it's not going to stop. So we have to plan for scale, we have to build for scale, and we have to be strategic, right? So we, we don't, we shouldn't plan for one-off kind of workarounds, you know, what, what are we going to do when it's double this volume, right? How is this going to work? All of that needs to be uh, in the planning. Now we keep, we keep talking about, you know, an information explosion and, um, you know, and, 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 and we, we sort of, you know, keep putting off actually dealing with that. So it's time to, it's time to actually, um, you know, address that, I think, head on. Sorry about the um, explosion of coughing there. Um, no I think I've recovered mostly. No, the, yeah, the information <laughs> explosion is never going to stop. So right. that's, just, that's just the normal. But um, so, yeah, you know, let's, let's move on the, from this uh, pretty quickly. We have um, the last one is the human factors that can add to the challenge. And, you know, of course, putting, putting malicious behavior aside for a second, when our employees aren't fully enabled to work effectively, to work efficiently, um, and, and Nick, you mentioned this, they're likely to resort to these workarounds. Uh, so they can maybe do, you know, select an unimproved or off-the-shelf application to fill a gap. And just to, to concretize this a little bit, uh, if we don't give them the tools, for example, to share information and, and sharing large files, for example, is a, is a, is a really big challenge some, some entities will encounter, they may resort to a commercially available application. Now you end up having your information not only removed from the secured appropriate environment where it belongs, but it's also passing through or being stored in an environment that you might not even know about. Um, and it's in, you know impossible to manage this. And you know, this is so-called shadow IT. Another way uh, is that in, that people might use existing and improved tools in the wrong way or ways that are not optimal for securing uh, your information. For example, taking information out of the secured environment and attaching, say, a file or something like that to an unencrypted email. Uh, you've not only removed it, but you've also from that secured environment, but you're now exposing it potentially um, en route. Uh, or cutting and pasting, for example. Um, and those unmanaged copies, of course, add to the volume of information um, and they make it difficult to find and delete that information when your retention period has been reached. Um, of course, you can reduce a lot of these challenges by properly enabling your employees. Um, and those are elements that are part of a, a solution to this problem. So that's what we'll turn to now. Can you flip to the next? Thank you. Okay, great. So what are the components that we have to consider? So there's uh, no one size fits all solution that can address, address the problem, nor is there really, a, I think, a single approach that organizations should take when they're implementing a solution. You have to do what works uh, for your information environment, for uh, the context in which your organization exists, including you know, cultural, uh, cult uh, cultural aspects of your organization. Um, things like content service platforms, uh, CSPs, or enterprise content management tools, um, uh, ECMs, may have um, any number of these components that we have listed here uh, that should be considered uh, in, in part of your overall approach. So think of these as kind of a set of tools, a set of capabilities. That said, those individual capabilities that we have listed here uh, could really be fulfilled by a separate application or a system. 
um, and application systems and platforms can be combined in different ways. Now that's, um, when I say this, it sounds a little difficult maybe in the abstract. So let's look at a kind of a specific example. So imagine you had a CSP or an ECM that has an enterprise search functionality. Your organization may have that over in one box, but be using an entirely separate solution to address enterprise search. And the question is, why does this happen? You know, why do you have um, this functionality existing in two places? And you know, some of it's a chicken egg problem. The tool was there first, uh, and uh, you know, the ECM was added after, and you, you continue to use the already implemented tool. The other reasons you end up with these kinds of hybrid solutions is that one tool might work better for your organization. Uh, it might have functionality. That search tool might have better functionality. And when I say better, I mean better suited for your organization specifically uh, than you know, what's native within an ECM or a CSP. So you can select what's best in breed or what's best for you. And Dennis, I know we, we were talking about um, this the other day, sort of, and in, in you mentioned some of the complex ways you've seen uh, right. Clients actually piece together uh, these systems, including I think you said some some organizations have you know multiple ECMs in some instances. Can you talk a little bit about what kinds of complexities you're seeing in terms of making a, a composite a hybrid solution? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I think we kind of long ago sort of gave up on this dream of uh, single place where all business data lives, right? Be it a ECM or ERP uh, or CRM, right? We just, you know, in the 30 some years of sort of very organized uh, information management in the in the organizational space, uh, we, we've really seen a lot of growth, a lot of change, uh, technology continued evolving, the type of, and volume and nature of data continued evolving as well. And so now we, we're in a place where data is clearly everywhere, right? It doesn't just live in one system. In fact, it, it, we, we really understand that it doesn't really make sense to manage all of our data in these uh, sort of single systems of record anymore. We, we maybe manage 20% of that and 80% of it lives uh, somewhere else on devices, cloud sharing apps, you name it, right? They're just not designed to be sort of uh, actively managed in these single systems of records. So, so as a result, you know, we have uh, many organizations who have many legacy systems as well, right? Mm -hmm. Most companies, most organizations have deployed an ECM system in the last 30 years, at least right. once. Mm -hmm. Most have deployed it several times. Several times, right. <laughs> in numerous departments, right, depending on the need, it may be this solution or that solution. And and some of them are just sitting there as with legacy applications. They still have valuable data we don't want to get rid of, mm -hmm. but we never really had the budget or the time to convert it each time we upgrade it or move to another system. So, mm -hmm. so what's really important, you know, is to realize that, you know, ECM is just like any other application or enterprise content management is, is like any other application uh, within the organization. And I know some organizations have hundreds, uh, some have thousands. You know, I've seen one of the technology companies I worked at, you know, we had, we had to go through sort of this rights uh, review and, and renewal uh, exercise with IT and just seeing that spreadsheet, you know, this was years ago with over a thousand line items of different applications that were in use within the organization. It, it was just eye-opening, kind of bewildering. It's just, it's amazing mm -hmm. how much technology we have. So, so when we talk about investing in new solutions for information management, it's really important that we plan for that kind of uh, scale and landscape. And we may want to aim to reduce some of this application mm -hmm. sprawl with our solution. So if we can have a very capable search solution for HR, why don't we make it robust enough to handle the other search needs across the organization as well, for example, right? Um, and then we may also want to make sure that it has capable integration capabilities to work with these numerous other systems that are in play, the various line of business applications, the various enterprise level systems. There needs to be a way to integrate and automate data flows whenever we need to, in order to make this solution really a step forward and not just another uh, another license and another maintenance to, to manage for the IT. And I think that's a that's a, a good segue into sort of the next topic that uh, you were going to cover, which is it's sort of uh, talking about how you can integrate uh, different routes of 
of entrance of, of information into your organization so that you're capturing. So multi-channel capture, for example, uh, getting information from these disconnected um, systems into a common solution through yeah, that kind of, of connectivity. Yeah, we, we, you know, we used to think of capture as just primarily scanning documents, right? And so we still, you know, a lot of organizations still do that. We, paper is still alive and well uh, in many situations and does its job properly. But, but you know, when we also, what other stuff we also need to capture is stuff that comes in electronically. So think about mm -hmm. forms, right? So uh, if you're still using paper forms or website forms, how is that data getting into your systems there? It needs to go the ERP, mm -hmm. the CRM, wherever else it may need to go. Um, data streams, you know, think about things like EDI, for example. Again, all that is, is ongoing capture of that data. And when we talk about capturing, we also talk about extraction typically. It's not enough to just digitize it as a, as a mm -hmm. document, right? So all that new stuff that's being created, all the new stuff that enters the organization, it, uh, we need to extract the valuable data. Maybe it's the PO number, the account number, maybe it's the address, maybe it's the line item and, or the total, for example, right? We need to be able to then take it and match it to the other appropriate system, maybe the ERP or the CRM, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we need to enter that data into to these systems automatically without again relying on a work queue for some somebody to manually do that when we talk about capture we're looking at an opportunity to tremendously improve process efficiency right mm -hmm. so we we can automate how this data flows into the organization gets to the right places and systems right we also improve data accuracy right so we, when we can automate this intelligently we can avoid some of the errors and the rework that may happen when data is entered incorrectly or when 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 it's uh, digitized uh, manually, right, by person. Uh, we can also look at it from the perspective of employee benefit, right? Nobody likes being stuck in sort of those Charlie Chaplin assembly line situation, right? right. right? So, so we we want people to be engaged in jobs that excite them and that offer not them- Not data variety. entry, right? right. <laughs> not data entry, basically. Right, not-, not yeah not feeding sheets into the scanner, right? So uh, it's also, it's also or, a great opportunity at that. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you there. Um, is it's a great opportunity to capture other information about your information, like it's classification. So at that, that, at that next, point, oh, okay, that sorry. Was my next point, exactly. So improving <laughs> great, great that minds. security and compliance, right? So right. You, when you capture is, is the first and the best time to apply those classification rules intelligently, mm -hmm. automatically, uh, apply access controls, and also apply retention policies. So we can kill a lot of different uh, needs with, with sort of the same act of capture. So thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so um, we need to just, I, I wanna just move through some of these a little bit faster to give you some time. Uh, and there's, I think there'll be some overlap too, Dennis, when you speak about the Highland solution sure. because uh, some of these, these capabilities over, overlap a bit. Um, you know, identity and access management, I mean, we've been talking about uh, the, the appropriate level of access here. So um, identity and access management, it's, it's its own discipline and we're not going to do a, a dive into that here, but it's, it's what connects your organization's people to the information uh, they can access. Uh, of course, you need to be able to grant, revoke, and modify the access to the information as well as the functions that people can perform. You know, what can they do with the information, view, edit, download, or print? So I might be able to see a document, but only... Um, you know, just see it, whereas Dennis might be able to um, see it as and edit it um, and download and print. Um, of course, many of the applications uh, and systems out there have uh, some form of managed access control or integrations with capabilities at the enterprise level. One thing that um, we want to consider, of course, uh, when we're looking at this is the ability to do role-based permissions. And Dennis and I had talked about this. Uh, one of the issues from a security perspective of, is, of course, permission creep. Dennis, you talked about people moving from one job to another uh, within an organization. And sometimes if, if you connect this information uh, to the individual as opposed to the role, uh, there can be what's called permissions creep, the, the sort of the data, the, the access levels following them as opposed to following the role are being cut off when they um, go from one role to the next. Yeah, that, just, just as you said, Anne, I mean, this is definitely something that's more of a risk today and, and planning for that and having policies that are group policies as opposed to individual policies is, is definitely the way to do this to avoid uh, this potential risk. 
So enterprise search, I think this one is a, a fairly obvious one. Again, we've, we've already talked about the complexities of our information environment, information being spread all over the place. Um, there are obvious efficiencies to being able to search from a single point of access rather than jumping from system to system to system. Um, and uh, so this is an important functionality you want to look for, as well as its connectivity to the access controls that we just discussed. You want to make sure that any search results um, deliver only those results uh, that a role or per a person has permission to see. So you don't want this to be um, you know, disconnected from that functionality. You also want to look for um, the ability to sort of connect. Uh, Dennis, you talked about this, the ability to connect to these different um, locations, access different file types, uh, viewer capabilities as well. Do you need a native application to look at the return results or can you, you know, view it within that, that system itself? There's more information. I know, Nick, you've mentioned in the, in the chat here that there's a white paper that will go into some more detail on this. So as we zip through these, don't, don't feel that um, you can't access some more information on this. Certainly, we can turn to the white paper and there's more detail on each one of these in there. Um, related to um, enterprise uh, search, of course, is enterprise discovery and compliance. It's basically, um, I think you described it this way in one of our conversations, it's putting putting um, those search capabilities in the hands of your compliance people, uh, connecting instead of, instead of searching for information just to find it, you're searching for sensitive information so that you can monitor compliance, for example, with policies and also remediate information when you find it. Uh, so that's a, a capability that organizations want to want to consider as well. Very often those, those capabilities are, are within one and the same tool. Um, Dennis, you want to talk quickly about sort of the granular uh, control, more granular access controls of information like redaction and, and such? Yeah, so I think that's, that's often something that's underutilized. You know, a lot of organizations have this great understanding of sort of segregating uh, access privileges by a system or by a particular department or role. But, you know, there's also very neat, intelligent capabilities to uh, granularly apply these access controls at the document level. So, for example, if you have access to a particular document like somebody's application, a student's application or mm -hmm. a healthcare record, uh, you may need to see certain information in that document, but you may not necessarily need to see their social security number or their mm -hmm. credit card number or other sensitive information. So something like masking, data masking is a dynamic tool that's available in uh, content management applications, um, can actually exclude that data based on your access level. So for example, uh, if I don't, if I'm not supposed to see social security numbers, I'll still see the document, but instead of that number, I'll see a bunch of X's or pound signs or whatever other symbol we use to do, uh, use for that. So that's a great additional control where we can still give users the access to information they need, but not unnecessarily expose information they shouldn't see. And sometimes those can, I, I know this is important to when you're repurposing data, um, or well, I shouldn't say repurposing, but using data to test a system. So you're, you know, you don't need, you're, you're setting up validating an environment and you need data that looks like the source data. Yeah. Um, but doesn't expose that information to uh, your IT staff, for example, when they're they're setting up an environment. It's it's not your production data, but it's a test environment. So you can, in some instances, replicate um, the structure of that uh, that uh, that hidden data with dummy data that looks like uh, the same information. So. Yeah. But that's another capability. Uh, we've already talked about uh, retention and defensible disposition a bit, but um, I want to stress that this is incredibly important. Uh, if you, you know, it's again that final revocation of the access rights, as well as your final securing of the document. And of course, that's dependent on how well you can delete the, the information that you have. And that means all of the copies that exist out there. Um, a surprising thing is that some applications and systems don't um, don't have really good ways of deleting information. Um, you know, that's a they should, uh, but some older systems, you know, you know, weren't really configured in that way. And I think people were in the mindset in some instances of of keep it forever. So why would you want to get rid of it? It's about protecting and keeping the data. So you may run into that, and I've certainly run into that in my my uh, time. Um, so just to move over to, um, you know, your content, uh, you know, let's move to the next slide if we can, sort of tying it everything, everything together. I think we'll get a sense of this as you talk through the Highland Tools capabilities. The idea, I think, at a high level here is that 
any time that you jump from one system to another to perform a task, there are inefficiencies in doing that. So if I have to, um, if I can't share within the same application the information I need to share with an external partner or collaborator internally, if I have to, you know, copy that information into a separate application, that of course in introduces inefficiencies into the process. It may also um, introduce security risks if those things aren't locked down, um, or if I am taking the information, you know, onto my laptop first and then moving it to the the second environment. So um, the idea is there are some processes out there that um, are more amenable to this integrated approach. Uh, and I think possibly why some of the enterprise-wide efforts maybe have failed historically as people tried to do everything at once. It's hard to, to change an, an organization's entire information in one fell swoop. Sometimes it's more effective to work around known processes where you understand what the sources of information are, who needs access to it, what the requirements are, and uh, what information needs to be where, when to perform what functions. So those kinds of processes like ones in HR or accounts payable and receivable uh, contracts and things like that that are repeatable, I think are particularly amenable to those processes. So I'm going to hand this over to you, Dennis, to talk a little bit about the Highland solution. I, uh, Nick, I don't know if you had any few, a few words before we do that. No, let's, uh, I'm, I'm ready. Let's, I think we'll address some of these same points as I kind of walk through some of the things that we do at Highland. So ready to go. So, uh, you know, just as you mentioned, and, you know, there's been a shift really in terms of information management from these sort of monolithic ECM systems that we, we sort of expected and hoped would, you know, help us manage everything uh, within the enterprise. But, but the reality of the business and the reality of kind of customer expectations have changed as, as we went along. And so really what we moved from is, uh, you know, from this monolithic interface where we go just to manage data, to manage documents, to manage revisions and check in, check out and all that. We, we ended up with something so much bigger and better in, in our world is, is uh, this data really being available and surfaced at all the different business occasions and engagement occasions with customers, with partners, with internal audiences, right? So we really, uh, ended up needing not this really single library of documents that are centrally managed, but we ended up needing these very flexible um, capabilities that can be surfaced uh, to really enhance existing business processes, sort of instead of trying to kind of smash and mold our business workflow into confines of a system, we now have the ability to uh, start with our golden path, start with our best business practices, and intelligently apply technology to enhance those processes to make it easier for employees, for customers, for partners, and so forth. So what we do at Highland is we really, you know, we, for, for the last over 25 years, we've been a leading ECM or content services provider. And um, this is still what we do. This is what we do day in, day out uh, for thousands of our customers. We have all this experience. We have very um, uh, experienced um, professional services that can help you design and deploy and implement just the right solution to make your business process better. But, but as you kind of think about that information lifecycle and all these different capabilities that that we talked about, there is, you know, all the familiar stuff, there's capture, there's content management, there's process automation and so forth. Um, but really across the entire board, we, we can do all that and we do it all very, very well. But we also have additional layer of enhanced capabilities. So when you need more than just basic document capture, when you need intelligent capture that can, for example, automatically identify if a document is a, uh, is a resume or a transcript or a medical file and appropriately connect and extract all that data. Uh, we have that enhanced capability. If you need search that can search more than just your single repository, we have things like enterprise search that can do that across all of your systems and devices, over 500 file formats, look into all that metadata, those layers of data you talked about, the comments, the metadata, the attachments, 
and can also set up those amazing uh, alerts for you know things like pattern recognition. So I want to be monitoring my shared drives for anything that looks like social security numbers or credit card numbers, and I want my compliance people to be alerted if something like that surfaces so that they can then follow up with the users and kind of reinforce our policy for managing that kind of data. Uh, you know, retention records management, there is sort of the standard retention records management, but then we also have enhanced capabilities that offer a lot more automation, a lot more sort of uh, market intelligence in terms of managing certain types of data and automating those processes. So this is what we do. This is kind of the broad spectrum of the various capabilities that we help customers deploy across the various departments. But if you could go to the next slide, Nick, please. Um, what really makes it all this special, thank you, is the platform that's sort of underlying all that, right? So you could certainly buy all those loose applications independently. You could go and buy, you know, source a different capture solution from this search solution, from retention solution. You could do all that. But truly, I think some of the magic happens when there is this unifying platform um, that uh, is connecting all these pieces. You know. You know that old saying that the whole is bigger or larger than the sum of its parts. This is exactly what happens here, right? So it's not just a bunch of random technologies. It's something that's put together thoughtfully. It's, it's, it talks together. It works together. It can simplify how things flow from one thing to another. And we can offer it as sort of individual capabilities you can surface wherever you need to. We can also offer it in tailored solutions. So for example, if you have a need in accounts payable or you have a need specifically in HR, there may be a prepackaged streamlined solution that can already solve that problem for you. Or, uh, you know, as sort of a third option, and this is something we see a lot more customers taking advantage of these days, is sort of the option between build and buy. You know, we, we offer these um, low-code ap um, application development platform capabilities where a customer can basically take these components, these pre-built elements, and uh, sort of take advantage of the proven, you know, capable platform that powers them and assemble their own solutions, sort of using these best of breed technologies, but really making it their own. And oftentimes that is exactly what the customer needs, right? They, they may not need the extensive IT capabilities to, to do their own development, but they will leverage something like this and, and easily build these applications and solutions. But beneath all that, there's this common thread of, uh, you know, these standards of technology that we adhere to, to, to really enable this for customers across all these different experiences, right? So things like security we talked about, ensuring that data is properly secured and ready for whatever regulatory requirements may be thrown at the customer, um, simplifying integration, giving them flexible deployment options, mm -hmm. and also providing that expertise, right? Again, that only comes with experience of doing these thousands of implementations to really help guide them to the best solution that's going to help them improve their business and end the life of their customers, which is ultimately what they care about. So in short, that's, that's what we do at Highland. Uh, there's a lot more at highland.com. So I invite anybody interested to, to please visit. Yeah, and, and thank you for that, Dennis. It's, uh, it's, it's really get great to keep up to date with what Highland has been doing. It's, uh, it's, it's been impressive uh, watching, watching Highland uh, iterate over the years and the suite of, of offerings that you have at this point. Um, I want to transition us now over to the Q&A portion of this uh, webinar. I know uh, our, our time, we're, we're going to go over the, uh, the hour. Um, so if you want to stick with us for a Q&A, we invite you to continue on. If you, you've got a hard stop and you've, you've got to jump off, uh, we completely understand that as well. Um, if you have any questions for Dennis and myself, um, feel free to ch uh, type those into the Q&A box. You can find that under the, the, the questions uh, button in the Zoom platform here. We've had a couple of questions come in already. Um, the first question here that I see is for, uh, I believe this is for Dennis. Um, how do you address third party risk? Oh, that's, thanks, Nick. Yeah, that's, a, that's an increasing concern, I think, as we mentioned already. Um, 
many regulations now kind of place that responsibility um, on you as the organization, regardless if it's your partner or, or some other um, you know business associate that perhaps uh, contributed to a breach. So you know, it's something again that we have to plan for, right? So we need to very carefully start vetting our partners, our business partners. And, you, and when you talk about business partners, think about all the application providers, all the cloud apps you may have with various well-known vendors. Um, confirm with them that their data management processes adhere to the standards that you're asked to adhere to, right? Ensure that they have uh, uh, the controls and security measures in place to help you meet those requirements. Um, make sure that again that this becomes a top priority for your vendor selection process it's not just about functionality anymore it's also about that security and ensuring that secure handoff of data and it's something that you will have to really work through with all of your vendors so very important and has to start with planning and some of those those concerns if i can add to that it, you know we were considering a lot of the sort of data security concerns for many years with just sort of uh, e-discovery work. Uh, there were audits people would do um, of the security of the location. Uh, where is your server? What physical security is around it? And then sort of um, the technological security around it on, on top of that. So some of that is, um, th some of that kind of work has been ongoing, but of course we're adding this this new layer um, of the GDPR requirements on top of it, which is even making it uh, more onerous. It's, uh, you know, as organizations are pushing for this, you know, cloud first strategy where they're, you know, working for, you know, working to to either use vendors that are operating in the cloud as opposed to on their own environments, we're, we're dealing with those issues again, sort of in mass. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that we've finally gotten to the point where we, we view cloud as more secure and compliant. You know, I know that that was a big concern for the longest time, but I think we're starting to, to see even customers in the most regulated industries and spaces uh, start preferring cloud because it is a lot better monitored, a lot more available, a lot more reliable. I wonder, I mean, what do you, I mean, where do you think we are at, at this point? I certainly, I mean, there are, there are aspects of, you know, when you say the cloud, basically it's, you know, where does, you know, it's a, it's a box somewhere, you know, outside of your house basically, but, you know, you know, and, and there are, there are with some of the bigger systems where you have redundancy across multiple regions, of course, there's that kind of uh, security, but do you, do you have any thoughts on, on its introducing other risks like the redundancy of data and just sort of even, you know, we've seen a couple instances where people have made um, serious mistakes in the configuration of, um, of those cloud services. For example, I think the uh, DOD had opened one of their um, AWS uh, storage locations accidentally made that public. So it's, it, you know, there's a lot of security that you can uh, deploy, but, you know, there's also a chance that you can, you know, with it being out in the cloud, as opposed to your secure, um, you know, closed off environment that you can make a mistake. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, I think there's risk on both sides. I, I hope that we're getting better with uh, mm -hmm. cloud deployments. And, um, you know, again, depending on your cloud provider that that may or may not be uh, something that that's a risk you know we we see you know personally with with Highland we're seeing a lot of customers pick our uh, our own private uh, uh, managed environment cloud environment so mm -hmm. we're you know we manage it ourselves we, we we never have access to the customers data so they they have complete control over that but there is no commingling of data mm -hmm. and it also helps them meet uh, you know another side of these requirements uh, the, um, you know, the fact that some of the data has to be geographically located in a particular right. area, right? So a lot of European nations require that, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless at that point, cloud is no longer an option. It's the only way to really accomplish that unless you want to go stand up your own data center in a particular uh, is, geography. When they're right, incredibly there. expensive and risky Absolutely. as well. So. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, several questions in at this point. Um, the next one is for Anne. Uh, how do you address rapidly changing uh, legal and regulatory environment? Well, you know, this one, this one's a hard one. So, uh, or it's, it's hard to address it, but you can't, I mean, most organizations don't have the internal capability of monitoring, you know, hundreds of jurisdictions, let alone um, multiple jurisdictions across different languages. So it's, it's bad enough to interpret. It's, it's hard enough, I think, to interpret, 
uh, legal and regulatory requirements in English for me to, you know, I don't have any capabilities of doing that in, um, you know, in French, for example. So there are services out there that are available that help people monitor, so that are continuously monitoring uh, within, you know, your geographical region uh, or the ones, the jurisdictions that are relevant to your organization and can feed back that information to you. And, you know, th they have lawyers or, or um, legal uh, legal people basically who are our native language speakers reading and reviewing that information and serving it back to you in a in a, a, a digestible form and there are services that do that another you know thing that you should consider is working with um, industry groups a lot of those um, you know have have at least uh, a good baseline to start with uh, in terms of, um, say, a, re a records retention schedule, and are are pretty good at at sharing um, updates to those things uh, within the the industry groups. But I think indispensable at this point, and and a good value really for for what they do, is these are these um, external services that that update requirements uh, continually and serve them back to you so you can make decisions on them. And the other part of it is, you know, in some instances, you know, you're just getting an update on a change. It may or may not impact, for example, your retention period. Uh, you may have um, a sufficient buffer in there. For example, if you're, if you're maintaining contracts for 10 years and something, you know, changes in one jurisdiction that moves it from, say, six years to, to seven, um, you know, it's not a problem if you have that little buffer built in there. So uh, not every single change is going to lead to, you um, you know, a, a change in your retention schedule, for example, but it's good to have those things monitored and tracked and, and work with these um, systems that do that. Uh, next question here uh, is from Amitab. He says, can you speak about the software's capabilities? I'm assuming this is for you, Dennis. Uh, the software's capabilities for information architecture and auto classification. So assuming that, you know, we're talking about sort of the capture stage, right? So this is again, an ability of one of our enhanced offerings from Highland with intelligent capture called, uh, it's a platform called Brainware actually. And uh, it, it's actually capable of applying through metadata, those uh, classification layers to the, to the data. So when you're capturing say a, uh, HR document versus a um, accounting document. That is something that uh, can be automatically detected so that we can apply that classification and then plug that into the retention schedule and access policies so that when that document is actually stored in the system, it already has all that data uh, applied to it and nobody has to manually go through and do that. So I think it's a fantastic time saver. And again, it's something that can be done also with, uh, you know, digital data that's not being captured from paper. Um, you know, there's ways to accomplish that as well. So I'd strongly advise, you know, I've, I've been kind of involved in compliance and security space for a while now. And I strongly advise companies to automate that process because we never get back and, and retroactively apply all those classification and retention rules. Life just gets in the way business does. And so, if you can do it at the point of capture or ingestion into your organization, that is the best time to do it so that you don't miss that step afterwards. But if you're interested specifically about the capture uh, capabilities, uh, if you go to highland.com, there's a, there's a platform and capture section and it, it'll go into a lot more detail. You'll, you'll be able to see a demo of Brainware and some of the other cool features that it can, it can do. So thanks for the question. I think we have time for one more question. I'll, I'll keep us to to uh, 310 ish, um, uh, my local time. Uh, actually, this there's one here that's a really quick. Do you provide, uh, Dennis? Again, for you, you're getting you're getting the groundswell of questions here. Do you provide staff training for organizations on your software, and do you have a base in Canada? Uh, I know we have customers in Canada. I know we have offices there. Uh, I'm I'm not. Sure. I'll have to follow up and make sure we can provide training specifically in Canada. Um, I'll be happy to take that question, Nick, if you can forward me the, the person, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to get you the answer, but we absolutely, we have a very robust uh, training department that will help you with aspects of software and also kind of best practices because technology is just part of the equation. There's no solution that's sort of a magic bullet that's going to solve your business needs. Sometimes it's about changing 
uh, culture and practices and policies around uh, how you do things and not just automating them. Anybody can automate a bad process, right, and make it faster. Right. We want to create a better process that's better for your organization. So, so we have all that expertise. And, and again, I'm happy to get you information on Canada um, training facilities. Uh, let me check into that. Perfect. Francis, we'll get that info for you after the webinar. Um, uh, since that one was a short one, uh, one, one last one here. Does Highland have the ability to manage and track locations of physical uh, records as well, whether it's on-site or off-site? I'm not sure about locations specifically, uh, but I know that we, we allow you to track sort of mixed media. So you can, you can track retention and, and uh, destruction and, and sort of the, the audit trail for both digital and paper uh, mm -hmm. documents. And that's something that a lot of companies require uh, these days because a lot of them still have a considerable backlog of these paper documents that haven't expired their retention periods yet. But in terms of like asset management of paper, I'm, I'm not positive on that. I'd have to check into that as well. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll get that information out after the webinar for them as well. Um, I, I wanna thank uh, Dennis and Ann uh, for today's webinar. This one was packed with a, a ton of information and my, my brain is, is uh, all, firing at all cylinders at this point. Uh, we'll have a, a white paper that will be coming out um, on this topic and go into some additional depth in some of these, these areas that we discussed today. Uh, we'll be sure to send you those details by the end of the week along with uh, the recording of today's webinar and uh, access to slides if you, you so desire. Um, I, I also wanna thank uh, uh, Dennis and Ann for continuing to serve this community and sharing their knowledge. Um, our next webinar is gonna be announced very soon, so keep an eye on your email inbox or social media. Uh, before we close, I'd like to remind you to become a professional member of ARMA International. Take the time to invest in yourself. Uh, while you're at it, you can register for the ARMA conference in Nashville this October. Uh, ARMA has an array of resources available from our white papers, uh, which you'll be getting a copy of one uh, shortly. Uh, we have training uh, available to you, as well as uh, including our brand new Essentials of Information Governance training course, uh, as well as our magazine. In our magazine right now, there are an array of articles on an uh, uh, an array of topics. You can find that at magazine.arma.org. Um, on behalf of our speakers, uh, the wonderful folks at Highland who give of their time and money to sponsor programming like this webinar today, and from all of us at Arma International, including the folks that are, are scurrying behind the scenes to make all of this available for you, uh, I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar and wish you the best in all of your information endeavors. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. I look forward to seeing you all at Arma Live as well. We'll be there. See you soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.